Okay. Um, so welcome back. I had, um, just so you know, I had kind of messed up the resolution on that last video. Um, like I said at the beginning, it was like my first time going at this. I sort of knew what I was doing, not all the way. Um, but I think what I'll do now is just like a little bit of a recap on what I did. But the main bit of this video is going to be about how to add samples onto your production if they feel like they're lacking a little bit. Um, so just to recap, you know, I went back. Um, you can go watch the previous video if you want to to get a little bit of like, you know, more in depth on it. But first thing I did was go and check out, you know, the phase relationship in the overheads making sure that they're completely in phase, maybe doing a little bit of delay on one of them if necessary, a phase flip, something like that, and then adjusting gain to put the snare dead center. And then I would go through, kind of do a little bit of a mono making thing, everything under, I guess this was 294 hertz. That's not like a specific number, that's just where it started to sound like it was in the middle for me. So I did that to the overheads, all the room tracks. Uh, I actually wound up realizing that I had forgotten to mess with the mono room mic at all. So I can go in and kind of mess with that a little bit. Probably gonna turn off this limiting and stuff first. Yeah, I showed you guys how to do the spike with the gating. And the spike is actually gonna be a really important thing for doing the sample replacing, not necessarily replacing, but the, the sample blending. And that's also a place you'll learn very quickly if any of your spikes are a little bit off and then you can adjust them and ultimately go back and it'll make your gating a little bit better. Sometimes you don't really notice if the spikes are off with the gating, but with the sample replacing, you definitely notice very quickly um, if they're off even just by a little bit. So that's why I told you to go in, you know, on the hit point detection and really make sure they're like as close to this initial transient as you can, because it's gonna make a big difference when you start putting samples on top of stuff. So the first thing I wanna do is go back into this mono room mic and really decide if I like it. I have it playing, but it's really tucked. I kinda wanna like mess it up a little bit, listen to it and make sure that it's feeling cool. So let's play back real quick. So right off the bat, I can tell that the, I, I saw the kick was out of phase. So I might do a phase flip real quick, see if it feels like the kick is a little bit bigger. It is a fair bit bigger. So one trick that we can do that I do a lot is I'm gonna duplicate this track. And then what I'll do is flip the phase on one of them so the snare's in phase. So we'll call this mono room kick. And then this guy will be called mono room snare. So then what we can do is go back to our key spikes and use our key spikes to only play the kick in the mono room on the kick track and only play the snare in the mono room on the snare track. So what I'll do is go here Throw the Pro G on here, and I'll use the kick spike. There we go. It's really quiet, let's turn it up. So we'll pull the attack down. We'll probably need to use a fair bit of look ahead for this one. So we're gonna have a lot of that snare bleed or that cymbal bleed coming through on this, but that's okay because I think we're gonna wind up kind of distorting this a fair bit. 
So let's bring this over to this guy. I have to make sure we switch our spike to our snare spike. Cool. So now you can see that this mono room is only firing when the kick hits. And then this one is only firing when the snare hits. So let's go in real quick and let's kind of like dirty it up. Let's grab the devil lock. And then we'll use this darkness control to get rid of that symbol bleed. That added a really cool mid bite to the kick that it didn't have earlier. It really kind of gives you that like beater sound, but like not the slap of the beater, like the, imagine if you're like inside the kick drum. It's kind of what it feels like to me. So let's see what happens with the snare. Copy this over. So we already have devil lock on the snare drum in parallel right here. So this might be a little bit of overkill. We might wind up just using compression instead. So it really kind of brings up the background noise. I think we could probably pull the range up a bit more. Just really crunch that up. It sounds cool, super buried, but when those ghost notes happen, you know, it gets a little bit over the top. Where are those at right here? You know, and that would sound cool in the mix because it would really let those have a little bit more room to breathe. Um, we could potentially leave it like that, but let's see what it sounds like with just like some really aggressive compression instead. I have this uh, Corniff Audio talkback limiter here. So this is just gonna absolutely destroy this. There we go. Really get a bunch of snap out of it, really mess it up. Let's check it on these ghost notes. I think that honestly sounds better. I could try it with both and see if that sounds cool. It might be a little overkill. Yeah, I hate that. <laughs> That's not cool. So uh, we're just gonna go with the compression. Cool. So. Now that we have everything dialed in and you guys can feel free to go back on the other video and kind of see how I got to this spot. I know it's a little hard to see. And if you guys have any questions, you can follow me on Instagram. Feel free to reach out. I'll put all of my tags and stuff at the end of the video and down below. Yeah. So if any, you know, these will get better. I promise. <laughs> I have a bunch of things lined up in my head about what I want to do for this channel. So let's, um, Let's just go from here and see what happens. So when I'm thinking about adding samples to a project, the first thing that I really need to do is make sure that I have the spikes, right? Um, another important thing is that the little ghost notes and the spike aren't as loud as 
the main hits. So one thing you might see me do is go back into this and kind of clip gain down some of these little ghost notes um, once I actually get samples on there because it's going to sound a little bit ridiculous if the ghost note trigger is like super loud. A lot of people like to um, just not trigger ghost notes and I'm not into that. Like if you're going to put samples on something, you should make sure that it works all the way um, with everything. So uh, first things first, I'm going to go ahead and add three tracks, stereo. This is gonna be kick direct, kick overhead, and kick room. Because the reason that I'm doing this and not just putting them all in the same instance inside of Slate Trigger is because I wanna send this to my kick bus. You know how I was talking on the other video how I have my buses I wanna send these separate so that it feels like when I solo this overhead, I'm hearing all the overhead at once. And when I solo this room, I'm hearing all the room at once. And I don't really want a bunch of room and overhead in my direct channel. Um, so yeah, let's go ahead and put these, that's on kick. Let's put this on overhead. Oops. Um, put this on room. Cool. So what I'll do now is go and grab my spike and just paste this spike onto all of these. So now I have an exact blip for every single kick hit that's all the exact same. It's a little bit dynamic, not super dynamic. I make the kicks a little bit less dynamic than the snare drum. So let's pull up Slate Trigger. And what I'm gonna use today is actually uh, some trigger samples that I made a long time ago. Well, not really a long time ago. I made them at the beginning of this year. And I will leave these down in the description in a Dropbox link if you guys want them. I think they sound pretty good. The snare's a little bit uh, low tuned. You know, it's it's cool for some things. It's really cool to blend with like another higher snap, which I might actually wind up doing with this but the kick sounds really great. Yeah, just really slappy. So let's put that here on the direct. Let's add another instance of trigger. Go back down here. That's the one thing I wish that trigger did was make it so you didn't have to, it had a little bit better of a navigation inside of it. in the room cool so what we're going to do now is open up our mixer and we're just going to solo these kick the original kick track play it back now let's slowly bring in our sample let's open up trigger so you see right now my spike's pretty low it's not going to be playing the hard hit of my sample so i'm just going to turn this up Cool. So now the next more important thing to do is check the phase of my sample compared to the phase of the original kick. And the best way to do that is to just flip the phase a couple times while you're listening, see which one sounds bigger. You obviously don't have a real, like a visual representation inside trigger of how the phase is going compared to the original here. So just flip the phase, see what sounds better, and then run with that. And then chances are, if you flip the phase here, you're probably gonna wanna flip the phase on all three of these, the overhead and the room. Yeah, to me, it sounds better flipped. So what I'm gonna do is flip this phase as well. And I'm gonna go back and check just to make sure that I have these correct. I added almost seven dB again here. So I'll just add seven here as well. Make this even, make this seven. And then same for this one as well. Flip the phase. 
7 dB again. So let's listen to the whole thing. Really nice long room. Yeah, that sounds great. So what we'll do now is just do the same thing for the snare. And to be fair, I do not think that these toms really need samples. If you were gonna do samples on toms, I would say you should make spikes for them and do it the same way that I'm doing the kick and snare. But the main thing about toms is just making sure that the tone of them versus your sample is right if you're gonna blend it. A lot of times with toms, it's really hard to get the exact same tone from a sample versus the one that was there. So a lot of people tend to just either turn this one all the way down or start pitch shifting the sample. Eventually it will work, but you know, most of the time, if you don't have good Tom sounds, you might as well just use the sample because a, a live Tom just sounds better than a sample to me. But if the live Tom sounds bad, then it, it makes sense to just use the sample. Okay, so let's go ahead and do the same thing for this snare. Three stereo tracks. It's gonna be snare direct. Oops. Snare overhead, snare room. Go in, add a sample, uh, uh, instance of trigger, <laughs> excuse me and make sure that these are going to all the correct buses just like the kick was. Cool. So the first thing I wanna do is grab my snare spike. And this is where it's gonna get a little bit tedious cause you're just gonna need to make sure those ghost notes are right. Um, might wanna pull the detail down here. We'll go ahead and turn this up seven as well. Let's see what information it's getting. Let's go ahead and do 8 dB here. So it's hitting the top of the ceiling. Yeah, that's looking good. The ghost notes might not be that loud. I'm just gonna grab this. Don't necessarily know if the snare is gonna work. Sounds good, but see, it's just like a little bit low. And also I, I record it with this like snare hiss at the end so a lot of times i like to just kind of get rid of that with the the attack sustain release section here just kind of gate a little bit of that hiss off um i do know that these overheads in these rooms sound really great though so a lot of times i might use a different direct but still use my overhead in my room. Um, so let's see real quick how this blends with my snare. It's a little low, so I could probably pitch it up a bit. I feel like 30 sounds cool. Kind of got rid of the ring on the original one initially, so I can't really hear where that ring lives, but. Ooh, wait. We're gonna go with 42. That sounds nice. Um, Just kinda making sure that that lives in the same general area. And that's kind of what I was trying to explain for the toms too, is sometimes the toms just don't resonate with what's initially there the same. And it doesn't really sound very good. So we're gonna remember 42. We're gonna go down here again, go to the snare, grab our overhead. We're gonna tune it up 42. Oh, another important thing, phase. 
almost forgot. I'm pretty sure it's in phase without it being flipped. So we're going to go with that. Let's listen to this overhead. That sounds pretty good. Let's check out this room real quick. This is what really makes this sample pack shine for me is this snare room. I love my room and I love this. Let's take a listen. So one thing we need to do also put it back at 42. Yeah, that sounds nice. So let's unsolo everything, see what we got. So I'll go and turn off the samples. See, the, the thing that it really does is just add a little bit of weight, makes everything a little bit more consistent, adds a little bit of ambience, a little bit of length, a little bit more density. And ultimately, I think that's what matters when you're adding samples. I don't think that if you have good sounding drum tones, there's absolutely no reason for you to take them and just replace them with something else. There's absolutely no reason for it unless you just do not know how to mix drums, you do not know how to make them sound good, throw a sample on it, use the overheads, maybe use the room, and good luck. But ultimately, if you've watched this video, and you've watched the last video, you can see how to make drums sound good at ultimately their raw state without the samples. These samples are basically just adding a little more body to it in case you know you get bass in there, you get guitar in there, you get vocals and production and low end like sub stuff and then you're just like oh man like the drums just really don't sound the same way that they did before you know and then you can add some weight with some samples you know it's it's purely subjective but most of the time i don't even add samples to anything so yeah i'm just gonna play it back real quick Go listen to this little Tom part. Yeah, sounds great. Honestly, couldn't complain, you know. I think that this is a really nice point to start adding in bass and adding in guitars and vocals and whatnot. I really like what I did with the mono rooms here. You know, there's plenty of things you can do and um, that'll probably be it for this video. If you liked what you saw here, feel free to give me a like and a subscribe. Um, there'll be plenty of more content to come in the future. Um, I have a bunch of plans on things I can do. I want to do you know, a full writing session. I want to show how I track drums, how I track these drums, how, you know, I mix a song start to finish. There's a bunch of stuff that I want to do. So make sure you like and subscribe, hit that little notification bell for future updates, and make sure you go follow me on Instagram at the Hourglass Lee. Thanks.